is one of the things probably I would uh, share with you. Um, things will work out one way or the other. Probably they will not work out the way you initially planned. It's all about people and it's all about networking and it's all about folks who you meet. I wrote this thesis, it wasn't too bad because the at that time CEO Heinrich von Pierre read it and I, I, I received 5,000 D-Mark, Deutschmark for that one. Then something happened which I think was kind of like a pattern in my life, my professional life, that I was always exposed to to situations, to topics where there was something special about the company. This is where I then fell in love with healthcare because this was one of the industries next to energy. These are, were my two favorite ones where, where uh, you would say, you know, with people getting older, with more people on the planet, with cr critical and chronic disease on the rise, these are all trends which drive this, uh, this structure. If you have a business which is really strong out of, a, and this is, this is entrepreneurial or from a leadership perspective, not an easy task. If you have a business which is strong out of a position of strength, how can you reinvent yourself? What is it like working with you? <laughs> Hopefully nice, right? <laughs> uh, my leadership style is that I try to be very open and, uh, and candid. Dear students, uh, welcome to the CEO Leadership Series. Uh, my name is Cheng Wang Li, and it is an immense pleasure for me to present to you the CEO of Fresenius. Uh, Fresenius is one of the world's leading healthcare companies. It uh, offers products and services for critically and chronically ill patients and employs more than 300,000 people worldwide that have generated annual revenues of more than 40 billion euros. Uh, Mr. Michael Zen, or Michael Zen, has been CEO of Fresenius since 2022. Uh, he's without a doubt one of the most important managers in the world in the global uh, healthcare industry, and is also one of the most prolific managers in Germany across all industries, having worked uh, for three of the 40 DAX companies, that is the largest and most influential blue chip public companies in Germany. Actually, indirectly, he's been involved in the leadership of four of them because Fresenius Medical Care, which has been in the DAX uh, list for, for over 20 years, uh, is part of Fresenius. So he's been involved in leading and running in a way four out of 40, 10% of the largest uh, public companies in Germany. Uh, Mr. Zen uh, was born in Korschenbroich, which is in Germany, close to uh, Mönchengladbach and Düsseldorf. He obtained his vocational training at Siemens and then studied business administration at the Technical University of Berlin. Upon graduation, he joined Siemens uh, and worked in the corporate development, corporate finance and information and communication mobile areas, among others, uh, quickly rose through the ranks and became senior vice president of uh, strategy transformation, later senior vice president of uh, investor relations and then CFO of Siemens healthcare sector. Uh, after a few years as CFO, he joined E.ON, the largest uh, energy company of Germany, as CFO. And after a few years as CFO at E.ON, he rejoined Siemens and was part of the management board at Siemens, the Vorstand. And among others, he was responsible as CEO of uh, Siemens Gas and uh, Power, as well as chairman of Siemens Health and Years. Uh, two years ago, uh, Fresenius was able to hire him as the CEO of Fresenius Kabi, a major part of uh, the Fresenius Group, and last year he became CEO of the entire Fresenius Group. Uh, it is an immense pleasure for me to have uh, Mr. Michael or Michael Zen here, uh, not only because he's highly prolific, very, very successful, but also because I notice he seems to be a centerpiece of our guest list uh, within the CEO Leadership Series. Uh, he has directly worked with uh, Dr. Roland Bush and Joe Kesa, the current and former CEOs of Siemens, who will be joining us as well. <laughs> uh, also with Dr. Leonard Birnbaum, the current CEO of uh, E.ON, uh, who was here last semester and indirectly with Dr. Lutz Helmich, the founder of Helios Clinic, because uh, Helios Clinic and Helios Hospital is a large part of Fresenius, and so on and so forth. So he seems to be kind of the connection point among the CEOs, and thus please help me and warmly welcome Mr. Michael Zen. Well, 
Welcome to our campus here, Ms. Zen. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And before we jump into your leadership activities and your company, Fresenius, uh, we would like to perhaps get to know you a little bit as a person, as a human being. So can you perhaps tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe starting with your childhood, youth, and early school years? Yes, thank you. That's working, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I'm already humbled. I was impressed when I when I got out, got in here because I saw this uh, tremendous lineup and when I when I look through uh, through the chairs and everything it's it's uh, tremendous to see how diverse international and global you all seem to be uh, that is uh, for one one thing which changed when I think back like 30 years ago when I joined university so first of all thanks for having me Thanks for having me on a Friday afternoon. I'm uh, between you and at the weekend and, and uh, everything else. Um, I'm humbled. Uh, and uh, on this Friday afternoon, I'm doing something which I really like to do. Uh, on our way here, I said I was yesterday in Madrid. I was at IE at the business school over there, had a look. And uh, I really enjoy, you know, having a dialogue with what I would call the next generation leaders and uh, to really also learn from you. Um, Want to know what's on your mind, and we will probably have ample time um, during the, the discussion and the dialogue. Um, thanks for the kind introduction and going back in history, it feels like I'm 100 years old, right? With, with all the, uh, the, the, the steps you have been uh, alluding to. Yeah, how did I grow up? Uh, as you can see if, uh, from the looks, um, my parents, uh, both of them, are uh, were born in India, uh, so they came to Germany at some point in time. I was born in Germany, uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia, as you said, but I grew up in, um, let's say, in a world where, when I reflect, there were, like, let's say, three elements which kind of like shaped me, and I, I'm going to get a little bit also as to how, from today's perspective, I perceived the world when I was growing up, because as we speak, um, I believe the world is changing tremendously. And we are currently at the brink of really talking about kind of like a new order um, globally. So I, I grew up actually in, in the northern part of Bavaria, in Franconia, uh, Neustadt by Coburg. This was right at the border. At that time, there was still uh, East and West Germany, and uh, right at the border, the border was still there. I could see the Thuringer Wald uh, from from the the garden of my parents. Very small city, fifteen thousand inhabitants, um, and uh, I'm now fifty five years old. So if you go back fifty years, the world was different. Uh, it was not globalized. My parents coming from India, uh, probably when they went to the supermarket. Um, pepper was an exotic spice. So the way I grew up is that I wanted to be like everybody else around me. So there was no Indian food, for example, for me and my parents. Uh, I didn't get to know that. I don't speak the Indian language. Uh, we spoke German at home. Uh, they taught me how to speak English, though. And, you know, my, my mom learned how to make the famous potato dumplings, the klöse, because this is what I wanted to eat uh, on the weekend. It was a very cozy and comforting way to grow up. Uh, very, very close friends uh, in, in, a, in a small city. So a lot of friendship, uh, belonging, trusting each other. And that was great. Now, as I said, uh, they came from India, so in a way, they did want to show me the big world. My father was an engineer. Um, he then, that's why I grew up there, uh, went to Siemens. At that time, um, Siemens had a huge factory on the telecommunication side, producing telecommunication cables and also the development of telecommunication cables. Uh, um, what, you, what we have today, glass fiber, this was more or less invented there and he was at the end the head of development. Right after that, uh, I went to Berlin. I also studied, like you, at the Technical University in Berlin. I had a fun time because when I went there, um, the wall came down. So I experienced uh, the wall coming down in Berlin, and I experienced how it is living in a city where, on the other side, in the former days, it was East Germany, 
and now the wall came down and how two cities basically merged together. This is a little bit of a glimpse of my childhood. All right. Uh, if we take a so very interesting, very fascinating. Thank you for your openness. Um, if we take a look, a uh, step back a little bit, um, you decided to um, study business administration. Uh, was there a reason for that in particular? I mean, were you always somewhat interested in business and economics or was it just pragmatic? Yeah, actually, this was this one of the things probably I would uh, share with you. Um, things will work out one way or the other probably they will not work out the way you initially planned. Uh, I did not always want to study business management, economics. On the contrary, during my gymnasium, I was more on the scientific side. And my parents, or from my father's side, this was uh, more a, a medical doctor family. He was the only one who did not become a medical doctor. He became an engineer. And so when I was very little uh, and people asked me, so what do you want to be when you grow up? automatically say, I'm going to be an MD. This is how they tried to convince me. So when I was 15, 16, 17, I said, the last thing I'm going to be is an MD because my parents told me to be an MD. Uh, and then I really honestly didn't really know what to do. And at that time at the Technical University in Berlin, they offered something like a Wirtschaftsingenieur, so it was science and, uh, and, and management and business, what you have today, uh, something together. There were the first kind of faculties around Germany, also uh, Technische Universität uh, München, Darmstadt, Karlsruhe. This is where this whole thing emerged. And since my father was at, at Siemens, they at that time had this apprenticeship, the vocational training called Stammhauslehre, where you were exposed to the more business uh, administration side and he said if you don't have a clue of that one why don't you do this first and this is how I got hooked up and and, and the second reason why I went uh, to Siemens is uh, at that time I grew up in a very small city uh, where um, primarily there are small and medium-sized enterprises a lot of family-owned businesses but there was this one big company in the old days he had 3,000 employees and whenever I traveled the world with, with my family, when my father used to you know, take out his business card, uh, especially when we traveled abroad and said he works for Siemens, I saw uh, the eyes of people going up like this. And then I said, OK, I also want to work there. This is how I got there. All right. Uh, so you joined Siemens after graduating uh, from, uh, from the Technical University of Berlin. And what were your first steps at Siemens? What were you doing? Also there, again, when I, I did the vocational training or the Ausbildung, and um, when I was finished with the Ausbildung, I said, never again. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to work there because I worked uh, at, 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 at more on the factory side in those days. With the benefit of hindsight, it was, it was great. It was interesting. I was in, in uh, power cables and gas turbines and everything. But, uh, you know, uh, when you do the training, you're, you're at the end of the food chain. Uh, so I said, I'm not going to return there. I'm going to go to university and I'm going to do my thing. I also spent time in the U.S. Du during my studies, uh, actually with Siemens, because the one thing I, I also wanted to work while I was studying uh, also, you know, helped me live the life I was living as a student. Uh, 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 so I had a part time job at Siemens. And what then happened is and this is one of the things I would try to share with you, it's all about people and it's all about networking and it's all about folks who you meet. And uh, when I said never again, then I was working part-time, I had managers, leaders who saw something in me, who believed in me. So I was a working student and at that time in the factory where I was working in the, in the controlling department, they had one of the first, in those days with the early 90s, first restructuring programs together with McKinsey. Uh, and it was uh, the restructuring of gas turbines. This was when things like benchmarking were man uh, mentioned for the first time. So, for example, at that time, we looked at General Electric, who were producing 30, 40, 50 gas turbines a year, while Siemens in Berlin at that time was producing two, three, four gas turbines. Uh, so you had a different cost position. Uh, and why is this? And you went into benchmarking and into levers. And those leaders already gave me the opportunity to also work with those teams. 
So this is how, how I, I, I you know, knitted my network. Then I wanted to go to the US. I went to Siemens in the US. Um, there again, a leader saw a lot uh, of potential and, and gave me great tasks. So in my last uh, years of university, for the last roughly two years, I was commuting back and forth every four months between New York and Berlin. And I chose, let's say, a professor where I wrote my thesis, who at that time had a, a great reputation at the Technical University in Berlin and concurrently in Gießen, uh, Dietger Hahn, uh, very, very conservative, um, you know, the whole business administration, uh, Betriebswirtschaft and everything actually emerged only after World War II. Before that, there was no, uh, n nothing which was similar studying like this. And, uh, and he was great. And he said, you're going to be my research assistant and you're going to do your PhD and yada, yada, yada. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I want to work and so on and so forth. And then he said, no, look, since you have been with Siemens, I will call up the chief strategy officer of Siemens and will tell him that you should write the thesis with him on a subject with Siemens. And this is what I did. Um, I wrote this thesis. It wasn't too bad because the, at that time, CEO Heinrich von Pier read it and I, I, oh. I received 5,000 D-Mark, Deutschmark, oh. for that one. That was good. Uh, and concurrently, working in New York, folks said, I don't care what your grades are. Once you're finished, you're going to start working at Wittelsbacher Platz at Siemens. And this is how it all started. All right. All right. Very, very uh, exciting story uh, to, to uh, get in touch with the CEO of Siemens that early already. So when you, um, after finishing your thesis, when you joined Siemens, uh, were you also part of the strategy kind of corporate development area? I was very lucky because I started with the thesis at the uh, corporate development uh, department, uh, but the corporate finance department with those guys I was working in New York, uh, they equally wanted to be wanted me to be part of their team. So they were almost fighting one another. So I started there, then moved uh, over there, and there again, I had a great manager. He was roughly my age. I was, uh, you know, uh, late twenties. Uh, so we 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 clicked immediately. And then, then something happened, which I think was kind of like a pattern in my life, my professional life, that I was always exposed to, to situations, to topics where there was something special about the company. So my first job was actually at that time, the introduction of the Euro. Uh, and uh, this was a major, major undertaking because uh, in, in compass, what, what is going to happen on the political side, what is going to happen uh, on the finance side uh, in terms of financial markets, what is going to happen on accounting, uh, what is going to happen to business strategy. There was no blueprint. There were a bazillion of consultants running around how to deal with the introduction of the euro, but they had no clue because it has not been done before. Siemens was one of the front runners and I was part of that core team. And that was one of the starting points uh, and again, in that starting department where, uh, where I had my first job, the initial agreement was that I'm going to stay there for two years, max three years. Then I'm going to go to New York. Um, I stayed there five and a half years because okay. one thing came and led to the other. All right. What happened after five and a half years? Then they said, now you have been at corporate headquarters. You need to be operational. And, and then, uh, you know, this was 2001. So um, after 2000, at that time, you might have heard of the dot-com bubble. Uh, so many, many telecommunication companies had magnificent valuations. Uh, and then the whole thing bursted. And that had major structural ramifications on the businesses. So also on the telecommunication business of Siemens uh, at that time, that famous Joe Kayser became CEO of Siemens Mobile, and he took me with him. So I had my first operational tasks there. We restructured the business. We went into what you would call classically uh, industry dynamics. Uh, why did it burst? What happened there? And, I, I, and he will tell the same anecdote. I can tell you one anecdote. At that time, both of us were not the top board members. 
a company knocked at the door of Siemens said, do you want to buy us? Or do you want to make a joint venture with us? And uh, those guys in charge at that time said, who are these guys? You know, let go. We don't talk to them. This company was called Cisco. <laughs> and uh, we did let go. And then they came with a structural technological shift, which is IP, IP technology. At that time, uh, uh, the telephone technology, you know, my father was a telecommunication engineer, was on EWSD technology, switching technology, which was, you know, blown away by IP, uh, all based on software, and Cisco was the big company. One of the great things, I'm going to tell you this anecdote, when I was at the telecommunication business and we restructured, China was the big market. At that time, UMTS, if you remember, this was 3G, now we're talking about 5G. This was the introduction of 3G, uh, a major, major step. And there was a standard in, in Europe, a white band CDMA, uh, then there was a standard in, uh, in, in the US, and China was still in the making, and they wanted to tender 3G, uh, but they wanted to define their own standard, TDS-CDMA. And uh, it was pushed out one year after the other. It was pushed as long as I was there. It was pushed out three and a half years. And we joint ventured at that time with a company. I was part of that joint venture team for technology transfer. This was a small joint venture small company nobody knew this company was called huawei <laughs> okay uh, so so can you uh, tell us a little bit about your story with huawei then yeah then they they we did the technology transfer china tender 3g they created their own standard and when i left siemens mobile to go into my next step uh, i said now gentlemen it's over at that time it was mostly gentlemen uh, it's over because one of the customers Vodafone in the Czech Republic was taking Huawei as their vendor of choice. So I said, you know what this means? This means they are in Europe. <laughs> this means they are with a global account, which is Vodafone, and which means they're there. Okay. All right. So, and how how long have you been working in that area, so to speak? And roughly, roughly. Four and a half years. Four and a half years. Yes. And then you became SVP. Um, yes. Or... Then again, something happened, which is not in the textbook, which no HR people would tell you to do, because you know I did my operational topics, um, but still in, in 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 Germany. So usually, according to textbook, according to HR procedures, they would have said, "Now you need to go abroad into a regional company because Siemens is a global company," uh, but. Uh, it didn't happen. Again, coincidence, people, networking. At that time, a gentleman called Klaus Kleinfeld became CEO of Siemens. And uh, his chief strategy officer was Joe Kayser. And he again took me with him. And, uh, and uh, I told Klaus at that time, look, according to textbook, according to HR, I should go abroad somewhere. And he said, yeah, you should, you could. But I'm telling you, I'm being the new CEO. We're going to change this company tremendously. You want to be part of that one, yes or no? This was in uh, 2005. And I said, yes. <laughs> and so I joined this group. This is where I became. And this, this whole thing, strategy transformation, was newly created. They didn't have a strategy transformation department because we, at that time, already thought about not only the what to do, on strategy, i.e. mainly portfolio, but also the how. How do we implement it? What do we need to change coherently? And at that time, we created, I think we were the first company at that time, in, in at least in Germany, really talking about the mega trends. We, we, we even coined that phrase, what it means, that we said mega trends in specific industries are trends which are structurally, which you know don't go in the cycles but which have structural, secular growth drivers. And we had a lot of uh, academic folks also around us uh, uh, advising us. And we, we, at that time, on a very academic level, said, actually, there's only one or two megatrends, which is more people on the planet and people getting older. And everything else can be derived out of that one. 
driving the structural shifts on the specific industries. This is where I then fell in love with healthcare okay. because this was one of the industries next to energy. These are, were my two favorite ones where, where uh, you would say, you know, with people getting older, with more people on the planet, with cr critical and chronic disease on the rise, these are all trends which drive this, uh, this structure. But also on energy, when we said the, the need for energy, energy consumption is going to grow. And at that time, I can tell you, we thought we have it, we have the blueprint. We were flat out wrong, <laughs> flat, flat out wrong with a couple of years. At that time, we said, there's going to be an energy super cycle based on gas. And uh, therefore, at that time, the company was ramping up the production capacities on producing gas turbines. When I was uh, the designate uh, CEO of Siemens Energy, we said the market now has overcapacity on gas because now we, with the renewables and everything which is happening right now. So in a way, yes, there was a super cycle. In the other way, we were wrong. This happens. All right. And you were uh, SVP um, for strategy transformation for two years or so? Two and a half years. And then, uh, then, then there was this so-called, first of all, this was another, what I said, situation or or disruption when Klaus Kleinfeld took over. So this was very interesting after Euro telecommunication, now new CEO, new strategy, new transformation. Siemens at that time had a compliance crisis, it was one of the largest compliance crisis uh, in, uh, in corporate Germany. So also learned a lot there. Klaus uh, had to leave uh, or left, he didn't have to leave, he left uh, on, on his own. And a new CEO came in. The first outside CEO for Siemens, completely different, uh, different ball game, and um, he wanted me to become the head of investor relations. Joe Kaiser became CEO, CFO, so this was also a nice coincidence. Uh, and then I was the head of uh, investor relations. And on his first week, Peter Löscher was the CEO of Siemens. In his first week, he did a deal. At that time, it was before the financial crisis, so the markets were all up. Hedge funds were all, you know, overconfident. Uh, a lot of activists around, and uh, we wanted to sell one business, which was the automotive business of Siemens, for a lot of money. So people saw a lot of um, share buyback, dividends, and so on and so forth. And the new CEO takes that money and buys a healthcare company for triple the trading multiple of Siemens. And on his first two weeks, the share price collapsed by 15%. Uh, so this was my first day as investor relations. <laughs> uh, and then I did this for one and a half years, only one and a half years, but very intense uh, because we needed to regain the trust for the company, but also to gain the trust for the new CEO and uh, needed to explain to the market why this is still a smart move. And after one and a half years, um, there was again change at uh, at healthcare at that time the sector was called healthcare and uh, then the company said uh, since michael is so connected to capital markets and to strategy let him be the cfo of healthcare okay. and this is what i did and even today i would say i was there for roughly 8 years this was probably one of my best tenures because I was very, I was at that time, I felt I was still very young. And they gave me a lot of, again, freedom to, to operate. I was by title the CFO, but the CEO at that time, who uh, I adore, but he was more on the academic side. He was a professor uh, for, for more medical research. So, you know, really how to lead a company, maybe restructure, transform a company. He gave me a lot of freedom. And I was there for eight years. You were you were not at the top rank. You were one beneath the group or the corporate board. That's also good because you're not always on the radar, also on, on public side. And it was a great time. Eight and a half years. There was um, you can read it in the newspaper. We introduced something like a so-called Agenda 2013. With this one again, we restructured the whole healthcare sector. We we sold a couple of assets and concurrently invested in a couple of assets. And um, then I left 
Then I went to Eon. <laughs> you you uh, left for Eon. Uh, how did that happen, uh, Mr. Zen? I mean, did they? Was this a headhunter calling you up? Was it the CEO of Eon calling you up? Or again, yeah, he did call me up. But uh, 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 again, a lot of things happened, but not as I initially planned it. Mm -hmm. And this is my my big tip for you. Life is not a straight line. It's not a straight line. It will never, also probably on the private basis, but on the professional basis, it's not a straight line as long as the direction is the right one, but the direction is also a function of what you personally want, then you will be fine. And uh, what happened, I can share this with you because we can even read it publicly. In 2013, Joe Kayser became CEO of Siemens. And in two newspapers, in German Handelsblatt and in the Financial Times, there was, and Michael Sen is going to be the new CFO of Siemens. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Someone else uh, became the CFO of Siemens, and uh, they had good reasons and arguments why this is the case. And I said, okay, fine. And then they said, something else will come up. And then uh, there was some shuffle. That academic professor he, he at, at healthcare, he left. And I did not become the responsible board member for healthcare or the CEO of healthcare, depending on what, what you want. And again, as you said, networking, um, not a headhunter, very powerful people in corporate Germany talked to the CEO of E.ON. At that time, E.ON said they want to split themselves into two companies. And he said, look, there's a smart guy uh, and told the CEO you should meet him. So I met the CEO of E.ON and he said, you want to join. And, and the chairman, obviously, uh, of E.ON at that time, Werner Wenning, uh, and he said, you want to join? And I said, yeah, I'm, I want to join. And that was a fascinating journey because that was very important for, for me as a personality because I left Siemens, as I told you, I was second generation Siemens. Um, I know the family quite well and everything. This was my world. This is so big, this company, so global. You can live three professional lives in there. But it was very important and, and starting somewhere new and Leo, Leo Birnbaum, uh, he was a colleague at that time, um, getting to know new folks and, uh, uh, and, and, and maybe same age and maybe even some competition and, and also being exposed to a different kind of industry where I knew the industry as a vendor. Uh, and E.ON was fascinating because a couple of years before E.ON was the number one in the ducks. It has had more than 100, and 100 billion market cap. But then came the Energiewende, and that whole thing collapsed. So I became the CFO. My predecessor, who was Markus Schenk, uh, who then was at Deutsche Bank, an investment banker, he was called in as a CFO because E.ON had 60 billion of liquidity on their balance sheet and didn't know where to invest it. When I came, there was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing, a stressed balance sheet. We wanted to split the company in what you know today, Uniper, which was in the newspaper last year when, uh, with the terrible war in the Ukraine and, 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 the, and the gas, uh, because Uniper was, was running all the gas pipelines. We were also investing in North Stream, by the way. By the way, I was, I was against North Stream too, but not of political reasons, because at that time I was the CFO and I said, we have no money. Uh, uh, but we, we did it uh, at the end of the day. So we split it, we, we built Uniper, we built Eon. And I was, this was fascinating at that time, exposed highly with German politicians. At that time, we struck the, the deal on nuclear waste for the final storage, which still has no real solution. So um, we, we gave, if you so wish, all the liabilities in our balance sheet to the German government mm -hmm. uh, and had to give money on top to them. Uh, and, and that deal was a very complicated one, not only in financial terms, not only in contractual terms, but this was how to deal with politicians, how to deal with a societal consensus, mm. because only if the German society accepts this deal, uh, it would go through. So these were the two years, almost two years at E.ON. Okay. How was, and you mentioned uh, kind of the different uh, ways of the business were run, uh, E.ON versus Siemens. How was it uh, as a leader, from a leadership perspective, I mean, transitioning from a company that you knew very, very well to one where maybe people were not that familiar with you and vice versa? I mean, 
Was it difficult? Was it very smooth? Uh, were there particular challenges? No, it is. It it has its challenges because you know, especially if you, uh, there are folks who do it differently. You know, they have every three or five years you change the company, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, and and then you get used to. You get in a way more agile than when you stay all your life at Siemens, BASF, or what have you. So it has its challenges because at Siemens I knew where to call, whom to call, uh, um, and, and how the whole thing works. At Siem, at, at Eon, I did not have that. So at this moment, I learned two things, that I had to rely on my own personal leadership instincts. So. Uh, since I already wor was an executive for a couple of years, I created some sort of a gut feeling, some sort of an instinct, uh, because if you are then confronted with decision making, which an executive does all day, right? Uh, you can look at facts, you can look at numbers, you can ask for another analysis and another assessment, but what is your leadership instinct? And Siemens was perfect because I've seen a lot. And the second thing is, was my external network. To be a little independent from the company you're in. So uh, may it be bankers, may it be consultants, may it be other executives, may it be mentors, where you can use and utilize that network in order for me to, you know, get to better decision making. And when I get to better decision making, then it's about acceptance and everything. And concurrently, how to behave in a new and different context. If you're the new guy, you know, don't open up your mouth too too big and so on and so forth. But also do not go into the corner, be too too shy and shy away from conflict. So how to deal with this? Reading personalities. At that time, the CEO of, of Eon he was the godfather. We were all the Leo and all others. We were the younger ones and he was the big guy. So how to deal with that one? How to deal with your colleagues who may or may not be competitors? And and that was a an experience I wouldn't want to miss. Okay. What were the things, the projects that you were in a way most proud of or the biggest projects that you were doing as a member of the management board at Siemens? Obviously, the, the IPO of, of Siemens Healthineers, um, uh, first of all, it then became Siemens Healthineers. And uh, uh, they, as I said, they didn't really know what to do. So I went into the board and the supervisory board and said, if you have a business which is really strong out of, a, and this is, this is entrepreneurial or from a leadership perspective, not an easy task. If you have a business which is strong, out of a position of strength, how can you reinvent yourself? At Eon, it was different. At Eon, after the energy vendor, we were against the wall. It was tough. It was hard. But from a direction point of view, maybe, I wouldn't say easy, but pretty clear because you want to get away from the wall, right? So you need to take that direction. On the healthy nears thing, it was they were very successful. So how do you reinvent yourself out of a position of strength? And at that time, as you said, I became chairman and I said, I have uh, two P's and then they gave me the third P. I said, I am paranoid. I'm embedded paranoid. And then the CEO and the board said, what, is, what does it mean? I said, you run your business operationally. I will always come with what disrupts your business, what changes your business model, what erodes your business model. That is the paranoia. And at that time, we already talked about uh, artificial intelligence, for example. We talked about uh, minimal invasive surgery, image guided surgery. Uh, so going from for imaging equipment going, which is mostly used in diagnostics, going more into therapy, talking about robotics and everything. So these are all disruptions. Um, and then I said, uh, uh, we need to create a currency. And I came up with the idea of the IPO. And the IPO was also something which was not in the textbook. No banker, nothing has ever done that because uh, usually you would do an initial placement minimum 25%. We at that time IPO'd 15%. Uh, but the quantum was large. It was roughly f 5 billion. And then the world suddenly gets very small. If you have to place 5 billion in the market, 
find investors because big funds will will put in a ticket of really, really big funds, 300, 400 million, smaller funds, much smaller. And then you need to add it up to 5 billion. It was one of the most successful IPOs. Um, I IPO'd, the company was worth 28 billion. I left, the company was worth 40 billion. And with that money, they did the biggest acquisition in, I think, the corporate history with 16 billion, uh, uh, buying Varian uh, on, uh, on radiation therapy. That I was very proud of. And after a few years, you uh, were hired by Fresenius. So was that something that you uh, had a plan for in the long run? Or was that, again, something that uh, you know, happened out of the blue in a way? It did, again, happen out of the blue. This was, um, you know, when I told you this happens once, it's you and uh, happens uh, twice, shame on them. Also here, I told you quite openly that they said, maybe you can run for the big job. Um, so I was running with Roland. Uh, at least we were the two internal candidates. And then um, we decided to split Siemens. We decided to create Siemens Energy, which was in parts even my idea, right? Uh, it was a little bit the Eon Uniper blueprint, but in this case, uh, it took different turns. And um, um, only a couple of months before it went to market, it was a spin-off, not an IPO. It's a little bit of a different transaction, uh, but has a lot of similarities. A couple of months before, I then left Siemens on very amicable terms. Uh, but uh, you could read that in the newspaper. Some people said big splash, big bang, big what have you, because they said, you know, Roland is going to run the industrial piece. You're going to run the energy piece. I was even prepared for running the energy piece. I was traveling with German politicians at that time uh, to, to China, to Uzbekistan, to the Middle East, because on the energy side, your customer base is uh, quite often state-owned utilities or the state is the big regulator. Uh, so everything was working, was prepared, but I wanted to have specific things for the business where people had a different opinion and then I had to take a decision. Uh, it was a disruption. Um, I'm happy that, again, I have a lot of good friends, uh, a network, friends, and a great family. So um, in an amicable way, I took the decision to leave um, Siemens. Uh, at that time, COVID broke uh, in 2020, and I didn't know what's going to come next. So uh, for almost a year, I was even in garden leave. So that was a disruption which... Um, I think not many people have. Uh, due to COVID, um, I had a lot of Zooms and Teams. By the way, it also had its, its, its again, different turns and positive sides. I met people I never met before. I Zoomed with people from the Valley and yada yada because I was contemplating what, what is the next step. Um, and uh, Fresenius was also a coincidence, also no headhunter, nothing, coincidence again, people, because they first of all asked me to join their supervisory board. They wanted to have a healthcare expert. So I joined their supervisory board and uh, then they, the supervisory board, I was part of the supervisory board, made a change on Fresenius Kabi, which is one of the segments, uh, needed a new CEO, and then they asked me. And I said the same thing, why should I do it? <laughs> and they said, oh, you will have fun. and. Uh, uh, and the rest uh, 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 we'll see. So nobody promised me anything. You could say, in a way, did I go a step back or was it a lateral move? But I wanted to make this move because I decided for myself I wanted to still be operational. I told you about purpose, Fresenius, healthcare. Even when I was in the supervisory board, I was getting this big eyes about the topics we were discussing at Helios, at Kabi. I came from a medical technology side. At Kabi, it was more on pharma, biosimilars, biopharmaceuticals, infusion therapy, cell and gene therapy, Helios, um, you know, really applying care. And uh, I said, I want to join that team. I moved with my family from Munich to Frankfurt, which, uh, and, and in a way, was different than with Eon at that time, started new. And when I joined Fresenius, Kabi, especially as the CEO, I had no baggage. 
So I was not Michael Sen who 10 years ago did this or 10 years ago, or usually are you a finance guy or are you an engineer or what are you? This is what you talk all day at Siemens. But uh, at, at Kabi, nobody knew me and I could start from scratch. And that was in a way also those one and a half years I only did Kabi was a lot of fun. Um, 8 billion business, 40,000 people, factories all over the world. And I joined during the pandemic. And Kabi does life-saving medicines, which you need in the ICU, which you needed uh, during the pandemic, propofol. It's the stuff uh, Michael Jackson took too, too much of. Uh, <laughs> and uh, propofol is, is an uh, anesthesia. Uh, and um, we are world number one pro producer on propofol and on other life-saving med saving medicines you need in the ICU. And our factories were working. Our frontline workers were working. The supply chain was working. And the supply chain isn't that easy. You need cold supply chain there. Uh, also, we did the diluent for, for the vaccine in the US for Pfizer. Uh, in a way, it showed me how that private sector kept everything running. And that was, was a good feeling. Okay, and somehow you you've been getting closer and closer to your family's MD kind of uh, you know wish for you, right? I mean, in a way, even though you were in business, it's always somehow uh, you know close to that uh, that medical profession and getting even closer and closer. Uh, after after uh, a while, you became CEO of Resinus, the entire group. Uh, can you maybe walk us through you know how that came about and what your job is nowadays? Yeah. Fresenius is, um, is really a great company. And um, before we IPO'd Siemens Health, and yes, at that time, we looked at what are the peers in the European market on the healthcare side. And, you know, uh, there's the, the Dutch guys. Meanwhile, the CEO is also a friend of mine, Philips, was there. But uh, there was only Fresenius Medical Care and Fresenius. Uh, now, nowadays, there are obviously more companies, but uh, we've always looked at it and I've envied it when my pre-predecessor was there, Ulf Mark Schneider, who's now running Nestle. And this was like an M&A machine. It was growing bigger and bigger. And it was a behemoth in, in, in healthcare. Uh, but when I joined, um, I realized, and many other people realized that for six years, roughly six years, the share price only took one turn. It went down. And uh, if it happens six years, it cannot be only a bad quarter. It cannot also not be only Corona. Uh, so there must be something fundamental. The second thing where Fresenius is really special, and this is where I learned a lot, still learning a lot. If you look at the shareholder base of Fresenius, Fresenius is a public company. So I have investors all over the world. On Monday, I'm going to go to roadshow into the US. I'm, I'm going to be in Chicago, Boston, New York, and then I'm going to fly back. So international shareholder base all over the planet. But we also have a foundation. We have a foundation which has uh, a meaningful share. And we have a governance architecture, a construction which is unique only to Germany. And uh, three DAX companies have that. Merck in Darmstadt, Henkel in Düsseldorf, and Fresenius in Bad Homburg. It's this KGAA structure, it's called General Partner, where, you know, as in brackets, the key shareholder, you in essence call the shots. Uh, and, uh, and this foundation, it's great to still have people in the foundation who still have had a direct link to the founder. Fresenius traces back to a pharmacy shop in Frankfurt, which is a couple of hundred years back, Eduard Fresenius. Uh, uh, we, we, we celebrated this last week, but it really was founded after World War II by a woman, by Else Kröner. She was adopted by, by the Fresenius company, uh, family, and uh, she inherited that pharmacy, which grew bigger and bigger, regionally bigger, if you so wish and was completely destroyed during World War II. And that woman, uh, with the help of other people surrounding her, was building up a company. And that company then was, you know, 30 years, 40 years back, which is only recent history, maybe a medium-sized company, couple of billion big. And there were other folks 
who created this global company with the 40 billion and the 360,000 employees. And uh, in the foundation, there's one gentleman, for example, he's 95 years old. He's, <laughs> he's very, very much still here and sharp. And I can have fantastic conversations with him. And he knew Elze Kröner, who uh, created the company. And that anchor shareholder, who has a foundation for, it's, by the way, one of the largest foundations in Germany, not everybody knows that, and, and supports a lot of medical projects um, and, and really world reputational medical projects, research, scientific research. So they need the dividend for Zenius Pace. And, and that kind of like two worlds that you have on the one hand, the international capital markets, which I think know quite well, and an anchor shareholder who may have a different perspective on things. And if you have somebody who's 95 years old, he might have different time constants. He says, you know, relax, it'll get better, or we will get it done. But also, and that, therefore, maybe in this, from the outside world, the decision making on there, and sometimes people perceive slow, or Anglo-Saxon investors say, it's never going to change, you know, look at uh, Thyssen Krupp in Germany or something like that. But they made that change. They had that courage, whilst in the past they have always been emphasizing stability. So that's why I said different time constant. What is change really? And but they felt the company needed a new leadership, needed a clear direction, and they were brave enough to make me CEO uh, almost a year ago. And uh, we'll debate that in a minute. And um, I'm there now 13 months. And that very conservative foundation, guess what? In the course of 12 months, we exchanged the entire management board. Oh. All management board members are new. Yeah? And it was, by the way, not done in a higher and fire. I'm e exaggerating now a little bit or deliberately, not in a US Anglo-Saxon higher and fire way. We, one after the other, we debated, fit, not fit, reasons, no reasons completely new management team. This I perceive as a lot of trust. And this is the how the journey started on what we now today call future for Zenius. All right. Before we jump into kind of the future um, goals and aims of Fresenius, um, maybe two questions. First of all, can you maybe let us know what a typical day as a CEO looks like? You know, it's a bit personal, but when would, do you personally get up? How long do you work and so on? Do you have free weekends? And the second one is even though I have the feeling you're very humble and down to earth, but obviously needless to say, you're extremely successful having been, you know, in the Vorstand management boards of some of the largest companies in Germany. What were your success factors, maybe lessons learned that you can give our young people here? You know, what made you successful? Yeah, I mean, uh... What I tried to already share with you is um, work on people, work on networks, work on relationships. At the end of the day, it's all about relationships. Even if you run your own company, um, you need customers, you need investors, you may interact with a regulator. And, you know, I've also now become more mature and older when I was uh, younger, uh, maybe a little bit older than you. Um, Sometimes people say, sometimes you burn hot, right? I'm, I, I wanted to get it done. And, and I said, the facts are clear. This is the way. Come on, let's go. And, um, you know, you learn that, uh, you know, you need to take people along. How does decision making work? In large companies, they can be as large as they can get, can, get, can have 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 people. At the end of the day, only a few people make the decisions for the top, top guys. And even if you are in the ranks, those guys with whom you interact directly, your boss or the next level or the next level, these are the ones where you have visibility and they have hopefully visibility. They need to know you. They need to know what you're capable of, obviously. This is more on the content side. Uh, uh, not only on the academic side, but what kind of person are you? Are you obnoxious or are you taking people along? Are you respecting the other people's perspective? Uh, and it is depending. Uh, we're also not talking about a happy camper culture. Sometimes there are situations 
where you not only need clarity, but you need to drive things with a little more force and sometimes not. And this is what you need to learn uh, and, and you will learn and then work with people, along with people. And uh, if they make decision, help them make the right decision. If you feel this is right for you. The second thing is you to be at ease with yourself. Um, the, the, the disruptions, especially the last one, no matter if I what happens tomorrow, if I'm not the CEO of Fresenius, I'll still be Michael Sen. And that is important. I'll still be Michael Sen. I will have my friends. I will have uh, my family, my, my wife, our son, and, 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 and many more uh, friends. And um, they are friends because we are who we are and not uh, what our profession is. And that is important. And that was a, that was a big thing when, when I left Siemens for the second time. In the first two weeks, my telephone did not stop ringing. And at first I was like, man, he is calling or she is calling really big names from international companies, but also ducks and so on. So I said, man, this is, this is amazing. They're really interested in how am I doing and so on and so forth. Forget it. They were not interested in how I was doing. They were, they were nosy. They were curious. They were like, you know, what is happening? This is like tabloid. What, had, what was that big fight? And did, did you not get along with Roland or with Joe? Or what, what happened there? So this is, uh, this is also the second thing is, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is fun. And you know that rationally. Rationally, it's all clear, but getting through the experience. When I was a board member, in, irrespective of which company, you also worked with a lot of consultants be it management consultants or headhunters or, or, or bankers. And as long as you are there and you have the, the wallet, you are the greatest for them and they, you know, they are all over you. And then you see how many people still call you. Uh, I, I know that Jamie Dimon gave an interview the other day that uh, when I think it was when he was in his late 20s, he was fired from a job and he said the telephone didn't ring. Yeah. So what, what you then see is um, who is really a friend or who really cares about you. And I talked to one German politician. I will not tell his name. You can probably triangulate the name. He was a very young politician. Uh, he was the defense minister <laughs> once. And I, I, during that time, I talked to him. And I said, I'm going through this experience, but you must have had a, a much worse experience uh, in those days. He said, no, 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 Michael, I'm going to tell you, you are getting the privilege now to see who is behaving in which manner. And this is how I see it, because the positive examples are there were a few folks who cared, uh, a few folks who are older than me, uh, more mature, ex-CEOs and chairman and who said, how are you doing? And for example, it was COVID and I stopped at Siemens, went into the garden leaf. He said, Michael, you know what you need to do? You need to behave like an athlete because, you know, I had a complete staff. I received 250 emails a day and, and everything was organized. Everybody organized everything for me. And the next day I was on my own. I received three emails instead of 250, you, I, I received three emails. And then like an athlete, you need to slow down because if you're full with energy, the energy, you know, physics, this is 100%, it needs to go somewhere. And, and then uh, you can do sports and, and other things. The day, how does it look like as a, as a CEO? It's a lot of communication, a lot of also hopefully listening and learning because at the end of the day it is decision making you are making decisions and by the way nobody can behave like an omnipotent ceo the decisions here according to corporate german law need to be taken by the management board so you need to prepare decision making if the board meeting happens, it's actually already done. <laughs> uh, the material is there. So how do you get to a decision? If you want to instill change, even in, in on, on the management board level, 
with the supervisory board, with my foundation on future Fresenius, I introduced fundamental change. Fundamental change. And I needed months to take the foundation along. Really intense discussion. By the way, they also told me they had the feeling that they were part of that journey. And that's something different than confronting somebody and say, here's five kilos of PowerPoint, read it, and then we're going to take a decision. The second thing is stakeholder. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm always on stage in a way. That's why I love this one, because this one for me is more relaxing. But I'm always on stage. If I walk through the aisles, if I go to the canteen or what have you, and out of whatever reasons, I don't smile. You know, somebody says hello, and I don't see him or her, and I don't say hello, and I really don't mean it. Then why did he not say hello? What what what's wrong? What kind of a hole is this, right? And and so on and so forth. So uh, you're always on stage. Stakeholders. I need to you know, uh, co-determination. Unions are as important as investors as the biggest resource we have are our own people. How do I motivate them? How do we tell them what we're gonna do? And this is, this is actually the day of a CEO and you're actually always on. Uh, there's 24 seven and therefore one should try to have space, not to have 24 seven because at least I don't know any person who can stand that. Uh, so you need your time where you relax, you need, and relaxation can be different things. <laughs> Sleeping on the sofa or chatting with my family or having a walk, do some sports, do something for your mind, for your body, for your soul, all three of them. And um, I still have room for improvement on that one. I can work out a little more, uh, maybe can eat healthier food, um, especially when I'm traveling and my wife is not with me. Uh, and, and not observing what I'm eating, <laughs> uh, but this is this is uh, and 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 still have friends. You need you need a room where I can talk to, and you know I may not be the CEO of whatever, but Michael Sen and I ask people, what do you think about that? Or I ask them a totally different story, a t different topic as to I don't know what, how would you choose the curtain in the in the in the uh, living room? All right. Um... I'm sure there are some questions on, on those topics as well. That is, you know, life as a CEO. So uh, let's maybe move on to um, future for seniors. So what we teach our students is as a company, it uh, can be quite beneficial to have, a, you know, vision, a mission and kind of goalposts, clear goalposts and use certain established one with future for seniors. So can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that, what yeah. that means? Yes, I can only... Um emphasize what you say when when I was um, more in the academic arena also studying the stuff I said well vision mission and, and da 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 and there was a one one uh, um, executive at that time who said yeah when they, if you have a vision you should go to the physician uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, but but uh, whether you call it vision or mission or what have you what I really believe especially in today's world that institutions and it in my view the same holds true for governments or even institutions like the eu you need a narrative you need a narrative a narrative which sparks something especially when you're convinced that you have a great base and you have potential if you're not convinced of that then you can let go so i took over i mean i i had the choice do i take over Fresenius and because they asked me, uh, do you want to take it over? And what is it you would do? Or how do you think about it? And I said, what is it I, ca uh, I will do? I, I can't tell you yet. I need to go through a process. But I am convinced that we have a lot of potential in the healthcare space. Healthcare mega trend is growing, is something people need, is in my view, with the pandemic we have seen is system relevant. Healthcare is in our moral compass, which is the SDGs. Healthcare is a matter, if we do it on a global scale, we can talk about health equity. Do people have access to healthcare? Do people have access to affordable medicine? Everywhere, not only in, in developed countries. So it's, it's, it's a great topic with a lot of potential. So it is about how can we tap into that potential? 
So we need to have some positive elements and whether we want to call it mission or other things. And, and the purpose is very clear. It, I mean, we, I don't need to do a workshop on purpose like many other companies do. Let's do a workshop on purpose. This is healthcare. We do good things for people. We can only do a workshop. How do we craft it? And, and I crafted it uh, saying advancing patient care. Uh, and, and I really mean all three words because everything is around the patient and I'll come to the strategy in a minute, but uh, everything is around the patient and, and the care is really the human care, which is different to the companies I've worked before when we are at Helios or Kiron Salud in Spain. Kiron Salud is the biggest hospital chain in Spain. It's by the way, one of the, if not the most modern hospital chain in Europe. We care, we deliver care. There's the human to human element. And the advancing should be that we wanna talk about innovative things, about the next generation. So advancing patient care is our purpose. So we need a narrative. On the Future for Zen News, we had a narrative. Uh, we, we, we are crafting a narrative. I once said that when I was at, still at Siemens and at, uh, preparing for the energy, I was giving a keynote with one other CEO in front of the economic ministers of the EU in Finland. And I said, EU needs a narrative, needs a positive narrative. Why would wanna, people want to join? You know, this is, uh, this is what I meant to say before when I grew up. This was a great, I grew up in the, in the greatest decades because borders were vanishing, the world was getting smaller, globalization, no borders anymore, one currency in Europe, the European Union, the biggest peace project after World War II. I, I spend a lot of time in, 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 in China, in the US, traveling the world, when I was 18, you know, people had something, I don't know whether you still know that, an interrail ticket. They bought a ticket uh, for, at that time it was, I think, 80 Deutschmarks and you could travel all over Europe. Because, you know, uh, and, and when I traveled first, when I got, went skiing to Austria, you needed to show your passport and yada yada, this, all, everything was gone. And now the, the world is changing and therefore you need a narrative, this vision, mission. And our purpose is, is advancing care. And our narrative is with the businesses we have, we want to build on three leading th therapy platforms. Because if we want to be impactful on a patient's journey, a patient journey, hopefully we will have more prevention going forward, but there's something called the continuum of care, which is prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and then post-acute, uh, which comes after the therapy. And 70 to 80% of the patient journey is still in the therapy space. And we don't talk about uh, sneezing, coughing and stuff. We're talking about serious disease patterns, we're talking about cardiovascular disease. We're talking about oncology, uh, uh, neuro disease, neurodegenerative diseases and so on and so forth. So during that patient journey, where are we the most impactful? And we are the most impactful on three platforms, which uh, we call the pharma, the, the specialized pharma platform, because what we do with Fresenius Kavi is specialized medication for critically and chronically ill patients uh, in ICUs, in trauma, in oncology, in anesthesia. Uh, so specialty pharma, targeted medical technology on infusion therapy, on cell and gene therapy. So it's about medical devices and technology, and then full service provider like we have on Helios and uh, on Kiron Salud. When you see the oncology expertise, for example, we have oncology, i.e. cancer, right? Um, how you can apply the latest stuff on scientific progress, which obviously has regulatory approval because on, on cancer, you need many disciplines working together. This is really mind blowing. And these are our three platforms. So. We have the purpose, we have the vision, and that is the strategy. And the strategy, in essence, is nothing else than where to compete and how to compete, or where to compete and how to win. At the end, it is about setting priorities. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, speaking of priorities, um, it seems to me a little bit of an almost 
classical, of course, it's not always classical, but um, diversification strategy type of thing where um, you're focusing now, especially on Fresenius Kabi and Fresenius Helios, whereas you're managing the other, you know, Vamet and uh, and FMC as, as more like portfolio investments. So, and, and we've learned all the advantages of diversification as well as the risks, you know, the economies of scope and so on and so forth. So um, can you maybe tell us a little bit of your approach there? Um, secondly, change oftentimes uh, makes people a bit wary, so to speak. So how do you deal with that? I mean, I know you have very high engagement, employee engagement uh, indices. Are there other ways you are trying to gauge that, trying to help people? When you look at Fresenius, this is probably the most comprehensive and the most thorough change in my up until now professional career. You know, this were really great points, like I said, a healthy years out of a position of strength. At uh, E.ON it was about surviving and we did it. And uh, uh, at here, when I say for six years, the share price has taken one turn, then the share price is only a reflection of what is happening inside. So when I started, I did um, a kick, a kickstart an organizational health check which is an engagement survey kind of thing, the first one globally. And um, the results were sobering, really sobering. We were uh, subpar under all standards, under all standards. So that means the morale was bad. Um, and uh, why would the morale not be bad? Because uh, if you are great students here um, and you want to start somewhere, you tell me whether you would have wanted to join Fresenius um, if you have only read in the press that um, they again didn't deliver and that the share price for six years is down and probably they, in, in, in other magazines, in more expert magazines, you will have read that they lost here and there and there and here. So the morale was not good. Um, I didn't feel talents were joining us. And uh, so we needed to tackle everything. By the same token, and this is important for diversification and M&A and everything, as I said, this was an M&A machine. The business model from a group perspective, so the corporate perspective, was that in a low interest rate environment, which we had for the last decade, and that is, that is a real issue, there are real experts out there professionals not coming from university having 10 or 15 years of experience who have never experienced a normal interest rate environment and uh, low interest rates you know can lead to misallocations bubbles as we see for example in the real estate business but it also as you can see at Fresenius because the business model is we're gonna get cheap money the cost for money was nothing and everybody who can only spell growth is going to get growth and the money. So in a way, you're trying to buy growth. But at the end of the day, you need to think about capital efficiency, right? It is how much money you put in and what is the return you get. And that led to the balance sheet being clocked up with debt and the earnings. And that's why the share price for six years, because the earnings for the last six years also only took one turn. And that despite of the fact that we're in the healthcare business and many businesses were growing, but then I did the classical things, benchmarking and everything, but maybe not growing to the extent they should, should be growing. So there must have been many things. And I said the business model, for example, this getting the cheap money is wrong and is dead. We're not buying growth anymore, earnings anymore. We need to deliver earnings by restricted capital because the the debt we had on our balance sheet was already here. This is like you have three houses, you have a loan or credit with, with the bank, and you're thinking about buying the fourth house, but maybe your employer said, I'm going to cut your salary in half. So if that happens, <laughs> you're in big trouble, right? So we changed the business model and I said, and then last year, same time, the terrible war broke out. So we knew we we're gonna go into a high inflationary environment. Inflation is really, really high. 
So we needed to change almost everything. We said the business model as we had it is dead, no business model on the corporate management around the CEO, there's gonna be clear portfolio development, corporate strategy development, performance management, talent management, ESG, because the biggest resource I told you is the next generation of talents. We didn't have a succession planning, nothing, introducing everything. So on the more hard stuff, which probably is uh, what, what you're also teaching, I did a classical portfolio analysis. Uh, Fresenius, 40 billion in revenues. I did not look at how it is organized and whether it's called Helios or Kabi or what have you. I dissected this thing in 28 business units. The business units obviously had a very specific market, a very specific competitor profile, a very specific technological profile. And then I plotted those, uh, those, those bubbles. And it's a classical two by two. You can name the axis whatever you want to, but at the end of the day, one is market, one is your competitive position. And then you look at how your, your businesses are currently. Maybe if you probably have the data, how it was four years ago, and then becomes the, the, the nice thing. What do you think the portfolio will look like in four years? There you have to derive it outside in. What are the trends in the markets and how will the businesses evolve? And what we then found out is, you know, um, maybe we, we had star businesses in the past, which were catering a lot of cash returns. Um, those cash returns ain't coming anymore. And that's why, you know, we are in the situation we are. So focus was needed. If you have a clocked up balance sheet focus, you might have read uh, two weeks ago that we are selling our fertility business. Fertility business, you know, for parents who want to have a baby, they can go to a clinic and then uh, it's uh, with IV and so on and so forth. So this is, and this is not a disease, by the way, it's a totally different business, a niche market, but the fertility business is also very attractive. It has high growth rates. Our market position wasn't too bad, but we decided to find a different home because it would have absorbed a lot of capital going forward. Because the only way you can grow there in volume, especially, is by acquiring clinics. Because other than that, this is a very local business. The organic growth is limited. And that's why we said it needs to find a different home. And then we said what is core. And coincidentally, it was Kabi and Helios, and um, this was the portfolio exercise. We did the same exercise, came to the same results coming from the clinical side, saying, if you are on that patient journey, where are the strategic points where you are not a commodity, but you're really having a clinical impact on the patient? And you come again to the assets of Kavi and Helios. And that's why we said, this is core. Then the way we wanted to manage is, I said, we need, to, we need to simplify. We need to simplify the structure. Those businesses are core. That's why we call them operating companies. All other businesses, like Fresenius Medical Care, we got 32%. So 32% actually, according to corporate governance, you can only manage them by arm's length. That's why I call them investment companies. At Fresenius Medical Care, I will also be the chairman but I'm in, an investor. I don't want to deal with day-to-day -day operational topics. I will give them goals, targets, guardrails. I can exchange the, man not I, but my team, we can exchange the management team. And then we're going to be an active investor. If we become an activist, then it's too late. All right. Uh, Mr. Zen, you've accomplished so much. You have big plans ahead of you. And... Um, Please allow me one last question before we hand it over to the students. Um, in a few decades, when you look back at, at all the things that you've accomplished by then, what legacy do you want to have uh, left behind? Yeah, as I grow older, I, um, I would have answered that question differently maybe 10 years ago. Uh, now I'm not that, um, let's say, legacy is too strong of a word. Uh, there's so much happening in the world. Uh, the world is changing and maybe I have uh, I've also experienced a lot of change myself. A couple of years back, I would have said I, I'm very proud because 
twice um, it was said that we have written industrial history in Germany with Eon and Uniper. Uh, you know, when Uniper was in the in the news, I was watching and I said, man, this is my baby. I I created Uniper and the new Eon and so on and so forth. And Siemens Health in years being such a huge player in the market, we somehow created this by IPOing this and so on and so forth. But then the world keeps spinning and uh, 10 years from now, maybe new guys in the company and somebody says, yeah, well, that Michael Sen guys did this and this and this. And they said, who? And, and therefore, legacy probably is too big of a word. Um, what, what I'm interested in is um, that I want to hand over that business, which I'm running today with passion to the next generation in a better shape and fit for that future which is then coming and if i will have deepened the purpose which we have which is advancing patient care then i'm happy all right sounds very good very noble and we wish you all the best and thank you for this very interesting discussion thank, thank you. you very much Hi, um, I'm Camilla from TUM, uh, and from previous guests, we learned that uh, throughout their career path, some of the important things were hard work, diligence, ethics, a pinch of luck, but this was the first time that networking was truly emphasized. And coming from a family that works in HR, this is something that I've been hearing all my life. So my question for you is, how do you maintain the network you build throughout your career? First of all, thanks for, for the question. I think that's uh, also a question of personality. That there will there will never be a recipe which can be copied by by everyone uh, on career development and so on and so forth. Everybody will have their own unique kind of story. The only thing we can do is share our story so that all of you get get the learnings out of that one. I think a big thing is empathy. Uh, and 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 it depends on the personality. Some might be more quiet, but still a great guy. Uh, people love to hang out with or talk to, and so on and so forth. Others are more more uh, outgoing. Uh, but but empathy, be be there. Even that's why I said even when I have a busy schedule, uh, I should take care of my friends. Do I ask how they are doing? And uh, also, yeah, quite honestly, I probably can do better there. Uh, uh, and some of them maybe call me more than I call them. Uh, but uh, when I talk to them, I tell them that I really appreciate that they called or cared and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's empathy. You, and and the, the, the great gift we have in life as we move on, I told you I grew up in this small city in Franconia, I, I had uh, this summer 30 years of Abitur. I went there, it was like, uh, almost like in the old days, we were like hugging each other and so on and so forth. But then again, life went on. It's not that I hang out with them uh, every day and so on and so forth. Uh, and I got to know many more people. This is, this is what I really, which drove me when I, went from Neustadt to Berlin, when, when I went from Siemens to Eon or now to Fresenius, everywhere I, I went, I took two, three, four, five, six friends with me. And maybe in 10 years out of those six friends, it will only be two friends, but net net, I was winning. And that was the great thing. So with empathy, I guess. Uh, hello, Mr. Sen. Uh, first of all, many thanks for your great insight. Uh, my name is Eklave Kumar. I'm from TUM and originally I also come from India. Um, earlier this year, I was reading that the Kabi manufacturing plant in Halden, Norway, was acquired by the Pranj Group as well as uh, Adragos Pharma. And um, well, it said that it is well known for its um, strategic location in Northern Europe as well as its um, quite advanced uh, technology. Um, earlier, you mentioned uh, selling off the IV business, so perhaps this could have been one of the main reasons, but um, from a strategic management point of view, could you perhaps provide some more insights about the acquisition? Thank yes. On, uh, uh, I told you about the portfolio view. The portfolio obviously was also too broad. Yes, you need to diversify. 
when I'm, I'm being asked, are you putting or placing your strategy around synergies? I said, no way. Because, you know, even analysts or investors ask me, oh, what's the synergy between Kabi and Helios? I say, forget about me placing any bets on synergy as a corporate strategy. I would also not believe in that one. If there are synergies and a few are there, this will never be relevant enough. Uh, but if we take synergy as the only argument, then I will end up with a company which caters man's shoes, black leather, size 42, only in Germany. You know what I mean? You get you get too narrow because, you know, as, as soon as you have a brown shoe, there's maybe or maybe not uh, synergies with that one. The strategy is placed in uh, bet, betting on do you have the relevant competitive position in a market with, which has runway for growth, which has an attractive profit pool, which may have barriers for entry, which is a strategic relevant point on the patient journey. Uh, and uh, depending on how much capital it does need and do we have capabilities and competencies. And if we have a lot of businesses like that and we have the domain know-how to, know, to manage them, then, then we're in there. Now, I told you that uh, uh, they have been doing in the past a lot of acquisitions uh, and never cleaning up those acquisitions. So the Halden thing which you are referring to is at Kabi, we under one program which we called increasing competitiveness especially going into this high inflationary environment was optimizing our manufacturing line in essence we had too many manufacturing lines too many manufacturing lines doing too many things some of them being under critical and therefore we needed to reduce the footprint and in this case um, we found a different owner in halden and uh, happy that we did the deal if not it would have gone the other way then we would have maybe closed it Good evening. I'm Maria Karen Joshua from Tom. So uh, certainly while considering the bigger picture, you know, it's our success that basically shapes the image of who we are. But personally, we know that it's our failures. Quoting Tim Ferriss, he basically said that failure isn't always durable. And sometimes when you look back, you realize that, you know, like, oh, maybe that helped me shape who I am and you can trust your instincts. And that's one of the most like two important things that you mentioned, like trusting your leadership instincts. So sorry for the cliche question, but my question is like, um, how has failure or you know apparent failure set you up for later success, or in other words, to fail better? And do you have like a favorite failure of yours? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question, and I try to convey this very indirectly because. Uh, what I, I think quite openly shared with you was um, a lot of steps by networking and luck and stuff. And, and, and luck is always where opportunity meets preparation, as we know, it's also a cliche thing, but it was also, you could have seen this as a failure. Uh, and, and then the question is, what do you do out of that one? Or what I meant with, it didn't work out the way I initially planned in a way is, a, a failure uh, and then what kind of uh, consequences you draw out of that one. On the one I said I was ready to change, that's why I went to E.ON uh, and, uh, and uh, because um, I felt, you know, this would be another failure if I had stayed there. On the Siemens energy thing, I didn't plan to, uh, to leave uh, Siemens and the company and um, this is another turn which was different. And I, I have a lot of failures uh, uh, during my professional life where you're right uh, that especially with the benefit of hindsight, you, you learn more. And, um, and, and with the benefit of hindsight, I'm, for example, grateful and thankful the turns I took, which at that very moment I could not always see but other people help me to see that and that's why i try to say it will it will all be good with all of you it will all be good you will all make your way depending on what you also want right as long as the direction is clear and so on and so forth and if i were to give you another word of advice in today's world what i'm trying to do even with businesses is in a world which is so dynamic as we currently see it the best thing is to have options and to create options and and creating options there's a hard side to it 
but there's also a mindset side to it. If you know, if I was at that in 2013, um, when I did not become the CFO of Siemens, uh, I was obviously maybe disappointed, maybe maybe not devastated, but disappointed and so on and so forth. And three years before 2010 to 2013, I, I would have said, this is what I want to become in life. Well, today uh, I'm happy. <laughs> Uh, it took different turns, and that's why I try to keep your mind open and have several options. Don't make your target too narrow, because the world is too dynamic, and there are many things we do not have in, in our control, which may make us fail or not fail, but not fit that other thing. There's a different kind of failure, like a professional or in R&D and development and so on and so forth. There, it's of course fail fast and, and all that stuff. But this is more the personal stuff. Hello, my name is Robinson. I'm from TUM. First of all, thank you for your presentation. I wanted uh, to pick your mind on a problem I've been working on. How would you go about building a healthcare system that is one, affordable, two, good, that covers a large uh, population? Thank you. Well, if we get that one, we will have the Nobel Prize. Uh, but, uh, but look, uh, I, I think that's a great cause to work on, and that probably time uh, we, we don't have too much time. But uh, this is this is one of the big questions uh, where why why I'm also in healthcare on a, on a global level. Depending on where we are in the globe, too many people do not have access to to healthcare systems and uh, to medicine or to affordable technology. So there are ways to, to do that uh, with digitization, with artificial intelligence, with uh, affordable medicine. You know, in, in our business, I see, I see three paradigms. Uh, one paradigm is uh, the biological paradigm. The other one is the tech paradigm. And the other one is the data paradigm. And one of our businesses is biopharmaceuticals. Biopharmaceuticals are, so, so to say, kind of the next S-curve of generics, but based on biologicals for state-of-the-art drugs with which lose exclusivity from the originator and can now be produced in a similar fashion, but at a, at a lower price. Uh, and that obviously provides more access to state-of-the-art medicine. From a healthcare system point of view, I, th I think, um, depending on a country, technology can play a, a big role. Technology can play a big role. Uh, things like biopharmaceuticals can play a big role. And then, obviously, there, there needs to be a will of the government uh, to provide access to, to many as many people as you can. Uh, therefore, it is in one of the SDGs. But this is a very, you know, the way you phrase it, it is, is, is very generic. We need to talk country by country how we can do that. We, we, we can talk about even in the United States, uh, uh, giving people more access to uh, at a more affordable cost to state of the art medicine. We can do that for Bangladesh. We can do that for Nigeria. We can do that for Australia. Uh, but th that's why I say healthcare is system relevant. This is what I try to preach to politicians. So I have no answer to that one. Uh, but we we need to work on that one. That that's what I call health equity. Hello, uh, my name is Sibar Karada, and um, first of all, thank you for being here here with us. And um, as you emphasized in your talk, there are a lot of uh, mega trends in healthcare business. I wonder, in your opinion, which ones are most exciting or relevant to your business, and how your company has taken steps on those regards? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think the beauty within healthcare is that so many things come together at the end of the day for that purpose of improving the lives of patients or saving the lives of patients. It is science and scientific progress. It's, it is societal trends. It is regulatory, the question of uh, healthcare systems. It is people who deliver care. It, and it's not only the physician, it's also the nurse and, and, and other people, frontline workers who really deliver care. And this all comes together. Um, th th therefore, I believe there is not one single trend. We define three paradigms, which I just phrased, the biological paradigm, the technology paradigm, and the data paradigm. 
which have the biggest impact, what we believe, on the healthcare system, combined with the businesses we have that we can ride on these trends. This is exactly the strategy then. Uh, and, and biologicals, it is, it is clear. I mean, every, everybody talks about data and artificial intelligence, but there are folks who say this is going to be the century of biology. You know, the first one was the first industrial revolution and then uh, uh, electrons and digitization. It's already done. Now biology. We are only learning how humans are working on the biological level, on the cell level. Uh, th there's great scientific progress on that one. You know, we already know how to uh, sequence a genome. And I met uh, Greg Venter, for example, who, who cracked the, the human genome. And then we think, oh, now we have it all and we have uh, the cure for everything. We are just at the beginning of everything because on, all what we know is um, the, 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 the key elements of, of the three uh, um, cytosine and, and, and what have you. And somebody told me this is like only having letters of an alphabet, but we have not put words together. We have not written an essay. We have not written anything. So uh, uh, think about things like gene editing, where you can manipulate uh, a gene in order to cure something. There was a, a regulatory approval the other day for sickle cell anomaly. Uh, think about cell and gene therapy. Uh, what we do in our clinics at Helios on oncology 10 years ago, lung cancer was lung cancer. We only knew the name of that disease. Obviously, we, we could diagnose it and so on and so forth. Today, we know lung cancer can be categorized in roughly 20 to 24 uh, different categories. Each of them can be individually targeted, treated, have individual maybe genetic predispositions or behavioral predispositions. So there's a lot of um, progress on that one going on. And the same holds through on immunology, that we've, we find out that we have cells, our immune system fights uh, malicious cells, but cancer cells, for example, are somehow under the radar and, uh, and therefore can, can grow. Now, if we take our own immune therapy, uh, immunocells, manipulate them, uh, and get them, inject them back into the body, they can attack cancer cells. And that is called cell and gene therapy. Just an example how, how fascinating that whole biology topic is. Technology obviously is clear. If you go to a hospital, what can be connected with what? Uh, I mean, a couple of years back, you went to the hospital, or maybe sometimes even today, you go to the hospital, you get in there, you know, you get that paperwork, and they said, can you fill out that form? And then you go to the next department. How tall are you? What's your weight? And you fill it out again, and you fill it out again, and you fill it out again. So uh, connectedness, but not only connectedness like this, but con uh, I bought um, one, one, one year ago uh, an infusion pump, which is smart, which has smart software in it, uh, which is connected to the drug library and, and is very precise, for example, when you have pedi pediatric small kids and they get an infusion which, uh, which has medicine in there, that you can really manage that and that is all being somehow controlled by software. That is connectedness. And data, artificial intelligence, if you ask me if there's one really major application field, it's going to be healthcare. Uh, but there, I, I would say it's augmenting uh, um, the, the phys physician either to be more efficient or to get to better clinical decision making. If I take my old company and now care delivery together, a radiologist, what does a radiologist do? A radiologist looks at images. And I would always go to a radiologist who has a lot of experience because he has probably seen a bazillion images and not to the one who just left university. Maybe he, he or she oversees something. But if we have the data and have artificial intelligence, then we may come to better clinical decision making. We just kickstarted a, a pilot project uh, with a large language model uh, with ChatGPT uh, or ChatGPT like um, the discharge letter of the doctor. You know, when you go to the, to the physician, you get a discharge letter that takes roughly three to four hours a day 
from the doctor. And they always have these terms, nobody understands what the hell they are writing in there, right? And, and we tried this for a cardiovascular disease with an LLM model. And the pilot worked. Let's see whether we can scale it. Hello there, sir. My name is Andes. I'm from TUM. Uh, my question is, what strategy do you use to deliver state-of-the-art medical products, uh, but at the same time affordable to customers? Thank you. Yeah, that, uh, that's, uh, that's, for example, the biopharmaceuticals. As I said, biopharmaceuticals are... Uh, like generics, but based on, on, on the biological processing. This is a bioreactor, so we have living cells which, are, which you are growing. And uh, there, there's great medication um, out there on oncology and uh, uh, immuno disease patterns. And this is what we are catering. This will bring down the price for, by the way, healthcare systems tremendously and make it affordable. Hello, my name is Magdalena Precina. Thanks for your impressions. It was very interesting. My question is, how does Vicinius plan to integrate technological innovations in the future? Thank you. Te yeah, technological innovation will play a major, major role. But um, what I'm always, um, what, where I think is the spice is technology is one thing, but how does technology get applied? There's, there, there, there's a whole route from having a, technological idea or product or what have you until it is really getting applied. AI, for example, what I said, in if we use it into our clinics, I'm convinced that it will never substitute the human because we call it the human to human touch or human AI because we are dealing with people. And when we deal with the patient, we are dealing with him or her at one of the most vulnerable moments. And uh, I don't know whether you want to have a machine telling you this and that and that and this, or you want to have the human touch. There's still a lot in, in, in human interaction which, which cannot be substituted. So technology plays a very big role, but it's always the application of te technology, uh, whether it's on medical devices, what I call medical technology, whether it's on pharmaceuticals or even on care delivery. So it does play a major role, but the more interesting thing is how does it get applied and does it get accepted? Hello, my name is Peter Yazician. I'm from TU and I wanted to ask the question regarding the recent management crisis in the open AI company and uh, where the company was on the brink of collapse. And I wanted to ask the question, so in your opinion, being a CEO yourself, is this a positive or a negative development that in some spheres, in technological sphere in this case, that the board of directors loses some power and on the other hand the ceos gain this uh, power thank you <laughs> yeah obviously i cannot uh, uh, i cannot uh, uh, make any comment on that particular case because i'm not involved by any means i don't i don't know more than you do reading reading the newspaper uh, but reading the newspaper obviously it is um, how should i say uh, wherever whenever you have turmoil that's why i mentioned my board went with us in ex even exchanging the entire management board. Um, I think companies who have stakeholders, who have customers, who in our case have patients, um, all those stakeholders want to have some sort of stability and reliability which does not mean that you cannot instill change. When change is necessary, there should be change. When change is overdue, it's also not good. But whenever there's turmoil, whenever newspapers already write about it, it's never a good thing. Uh, you should try to calm things down. You should not tr try to uh, you know, uh, carry different arguments into the media. Sometimes this happens. But then uh, people need to, you know, take their responsibility to calm that down. In general, and that's why I talked about relationships and empathy and so on and so forth. No one, no one is alone. Even if you are a one-person company, you will probably want to have customers or have suppliers or may have a bank. So we all have people and stakeholders around us, and. 
I believe in a good corporate governance. I cannot tell you whether it's good that he or she or the board or the CEO or whoever has more uh, has more power. But there needs to be a governance where there is a balance. Uh, I run a public company with one foundation as a key shareholder. So I'm acting on their behalf. I'm not acting. This is not my company. I'm acting on their behalf. I need to take decisions which are in the best interest of those who own the company. That may not always be easy because um, you may, you know, step on somebody's foot. But there needs to be also a governance body which has some oversight, which in our case is the supervisory board. So strong boards, I, and, and I am a chairman myself and was a chairman and ran boards myself, I believe in a very good and constructive but sometimes challenging dialogue between those who manage and those who oversee. And if that then works, usually these are the successful companies. Hello, um, Sufjan Latres from Habon University Graduate School. Uh, my question for you would be, what was the biggest challenge for you at Fresenius or even at another company and how did you manage to overcome it? Yeah, I, I don't know whether it was the biggest challenge. There was a lot of, of challenges, but the, uh, at, at Fresenius now, it's not, uh, it is a challenge, but I, I'm not afraid of that challenge, is that we have this really comprehensive transformation. At Fresenius, with future Fresenius, from all the data we see, from all the, the dialogues I have with, with people, stakeholders, but especially with employees, they all really appreciate that there's now direction and, and, and clarity and everything. But uh, the biggest challenge will always be when we have a couple of hundred thousand people who need to follow the direction that we get all people on board. Uh, now, I'm also not naive. That's what I said in my first leadership meeting. I would wish to have everybody on board. I know that not everybody will be on board. Uh, the easier part is those who really do not want to be on board because either they will find a different home or you will make them find a different home. That's easier. The worst thing is those standing at the sidelines and chatting. And it's like German soccer. Everybody knows how to best play soccer and know more than Julian Nagelsmann. Uh, uh, but uh, this is these, these, these folks at the, at the sidelines. So the, the, the challenge is always how to get as many people and the relevant people along the journey and to create that momentum that you then somehow then have a critical mass or a critical momentum that it starts running by itself. Hello, this is Salim Nasser from Two. Mr. Zen, my question for you, this diverse full of innovation career, what did, did you do to influence Earth or which approach did you choose to make it happen? Yeah, well, I mean, look for opportunities. That's why I said, if you go through, through the pattern, there were, uh, Obviously, I was always um, there when it was very dynamic. Uh, either it was a crisis situation which needed some form of leadership. And I told you when, when I was younger, I was probably not the top leader, but I was in the team around the top leaders who were just dealing with that crisis situation. At that time, the telecommunication business or in, 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 the, in the E.ON uh, uh, example or where there was a major change or a disruption early on, the euro uh, and so on and so forth, or even where, you know, health in years, out of a position of strength, reinvent yourself. There was no crisis there, but maybe I, I tried to not make a crisis, but the paranoid example was to say, if we don't do that, day after tomorrow, we might have one. And uh, I've been always obviously looking for, for, for things or like a magnet. I was there where these uh, things emerged. Um, I was at the beginning of the week, I was in an investor conference uh, and uh, one investor had a one-on-one -on -one with me and we went through the Fresenius and he's, then when I walked out, he said, yeah, well, you love challenges, you will do it. So this is, uh, it's, it's about your personality. If, uh, if you rather wanna have uh, tasks where uh, it's more, 
more gradual and so on and so forth, then it, there's also nothing bad about that one. Uh, but I was looking obviously for these kind of things to maybe display my strength. Hello, my name is Edgar Fung from also Heilbronn. And I'd like to know from you, what was your leadership style or what is it like working with you? <laughs> Hopefully nice, right? <laughs> uh, my leadership style is that I try to be very open and uh, and candid. Yeah? Sometimes people say you see it, <laughs> whether I'm smiling or whether, whether I'm moody or what have you. That, this is also what you have to work on. That's why I said as, as a CEO, you're always on stage. Uh, to be open and candid, very authentic thereby, and uh, you know, very collaborative. Um, I try to display that I was never alone, uh, neither when I needed people, nor when I'm in the lead and doing something, I never did stuff alone. It was always with, with folks around me uh, and therefore a very collaborative. Uh, but I would also say um, having ambitions uh, and wanting to shape something. So a leadership position where I have the room to create something, to shape something. Thank you very much uh, for being so open and, and responding to all of our questions and for this wonderful visit. Thank Mr. you. Zen, thank you.